As we continue to move on to look at the deployment of a native speaker's knowledge of the structure of the language, it's going to be important to look at the statistics of the environment of the language that they know as a native speaker. Not only the kinds of sounds or signs that they experience, or even the words, but also the more abstract structures that we've been looking at. What are their frequencies? What are their contexts of occurrence? And collecting data sets and looking at those properties in those data sets is a way to do that. So we do this by corpus annotation. So a corpus is a collection of quote unquote naturalistic text or transcribed or recorded spoken or signed language. By naturalistic, we mean that it's not created by the researcher through introspective purposes for research purposes. For example, I can introspect and think about a sentence that maybe feels like it's at the boundary of the language and write it down, but that's not going to be the basis of a corpus. Corpus is, is language that's used for its own purposes, usually to communicate with somebody, to speak to somebody or to write down something for an audience. Language in the wild. Once we have a corpus, it's useful to annotate it for its underlying properties. And here we're going to be looking at a historically and even now a very important corpus, the Pen Tree Bank of English, which has syntactic annotations. So this is an illustration example sentence from the corpus. You can read off the words. To her, peanuts and emeralds would have been so much, just so much blubber. But the brackets and labels indicate the syntactic structure, and there's actually a straightforward one-to-one -one relationship between that bracketing and a syntactic tree structure with a context-free tree. So you're seeing already structures that are probably fairly familiar to you. For example, the subject of the sentence is the noun phrase is directly to the left of the verb phrase under the S. And it's a coordinated noun phrase with peanuts and emeralds as the nouns. Um, the verb phrase is after it, and there's a sentence initial prepositional phrase before the subject, which is an OK structure in English, even though we haven't talked that much about that. Now, this sounds like a lot of labor, and it is. Once you've collected the text, you have to get an expert who's trained in knowing the structure to write it down. But actually, if you step back and reflect, it turns out that there are many instances in the history of writing systems of the world in what you should think about actually is naturally occurring linguistic annotation. So this kind of annotation process is actually something that's built in to writing systems in various ways, in different ways for the writing, different writing systems. And I'll give you three examples of that here. So one is um, the uh, diacritic marks in Arabic. So um, here we have an example where the, uh, the black is the obligatory part of what's written, but then the red and the blue are optional diacritics, which effectively disambiguate potential phonetic readings. And they're not always used because in full context, you may not need them because there's enough redundancy between the different parts to figure out what those diacritics would have to be, what some of the consonants are, what, uh, and whether the vowels are short or long. So that's one example. Um, another example is in, uh, is in Chinese which has a writing system which in involves these characters. So the only Chinese characters in this entire example are these ones right here, these four large complex looking characters, but above it are, a, are an annotation of the phonetic form, which is not deterministically knowable from the characters unless you've already learned how a character is pronounced. And there is a phonetic alphabet this is a system that's used in Taiwan called Bopomofo, which will be which allows you to write down a syllabic representation of the sounds compositionally. And so this is an annotation that's used not in ordinary everyday writing, but for learners' materials it's used, or for um, or for say newspapers with uh, an audience that's expected not to have a particularly high educational rate. And this has obviously changed over time as literacy has gone up. And then there's a third example, which comes from European languages, which is spaces. So if you go back a couple of a couple of millennia, actually it was not reliably the case that um, that word boundaries were distinguished in European languages. Um, and there's a fascinating story. Um, this is a really cool book, Space Between Words, which documents how in the monastic tradition in medieval Europe, over time in relationship with the practices of reading, there emerged a tradition to mark the word boundaries, and eventually that became the modern space orthography. So to illustrate what that might be like, this is an example of the sentence below it where there's no word boundaries. And this is probably a little weird for you. And to at least some extent, that's because you're used to reading English with spaces between words. But there are lots of languages in the world where there aren't spaces between words. Thai, 
Chinese and uh, Jap Japanese. And, um, and in these languages, people read just fine. And so word boundaries exist as spaces, but that's a kind of in English and other European languages and many other languages in the world. But that's actually, once again, a kind of linguistic annotation. Now you'll notice that these linguistic annotations are at a lower level. They're closer to the sound or to something slightly different than the sound, the distinction between words. The more abstract properties though, are also sometimes sort of manifested in, uh, in the natural orthography of a language. So for example, punctuation often bears some correspondence to the syntactic structure, and that's partly mediated through prosody. So if, as you reflect on it, you'll realize that in a lot of ways, sort of some bits of linguistic annotation are already nascent or existent in naturalistic writing systems and more full, full fleshed annotations, more full fledged annotation is something that um, has, you know, is sort of a natural extension of that. Um, I just, uh, so I and Pufetyovsky have a very nice brief and selective history of uh, modern corpus annotation, which I'll give to you here even more briefly and more selectively. Um, but I illustrate this because it, I think it's a really neat example of how large scale efforts to create data sets have actually been enabling for theoretical work. And we're going to see this going forward. So there were obviously for a long time, there have been collections of texts. That's what libraries are. But it, early on in the digital era, in the um, sort of mid 20th century, it became very quickly recognized that from a, an informatics point of view, from the point of view of collecting, maintaining and searching and retrieving information uh, in text form, um, good electronically readable text and corpus annotation on that text became very valuable. That became very, very clear very quickly. And the first sort of real um, landmark corpus annotation effort was the Brown Corpus of Standard American English um, in the 1960s. This led to Couture and Francis, 1967, which is a landmark publication. And um, after this, there were uh, there was also to the Brown Corpus, which is about a million words of a fairly balanced collection of English texts of various genres. Parts of speech were annotated on top of this. So there was a part of speech annotation convention that was determined and that can, that annotation happened. And that was very, that was once again, another landmark. So by the 1970, you had a part of speech annotated corpus of a million words. This is very small by contemporary standards, but it was very influential and it's still an important reference corpus today. Um, during the eighties, with larger scale language data becoming available, more computational power, and the rise of statistical methods in the later part of the 1980s, there were many new uses that became recognized for annotation of corpora, and there were now many more annotation projects. So the first morphosyntactic annotation project was probably the Lancaster Oslo Bergen Corpus of English, but soon after that followed the Penn Tree Bank in the late 80s. The reference publication for that is Marcus et al. in 1983, um, soon after the first version, there were other versions that were released, and by the late 90s, there were um, there were tree trees for many different kinds of text, including not only the Brown Corpus, but also the Wall Street Journal, a year of the Wall Street Journal, and also spoken language. So the Switchboard Corpus, which is a spoke, this collection of transcribed speech from people calling each other in a sort of a set up uh, semi naturalistic setting, um, also became available. So there is spoken uh, syntactically annotated corpora as well. And by now, actually, today, there are tree banks in dozens of languages, and there is a whole bunch of things you can do with syntactic annotation. There's also many other kinds of corpus annotations that I won't get into today, but are also relevant. So if you are interested in a particular kind of linguistic feature or linguistic structure, there is a decent chance that there will be some kind of annotated corpus for it. And it's useful to look around for that. Um, I'm going to tell you a little bit because it's going to be relevant for understanding sort of why the grammars that we'll be covering in the next sections are set up the way they are. I'm going to tell you a little bit about pen tree, tree bank conventions. And these are somewhat arbitrary decisions. You have to make arbitrary decisions in order to decide how to write your syntactic annotation. Um, and, uh, but these are important. So the first one is that not all nodes of the tree dominate any words at all. There are empty categories. And you may remember that we saw at least an initial motivation for possibly wanting to use empty categories to deal with things like extracted relative clauses uh, and, and so forth. So here's a sentence. I'll just read it and just sort of think about what the structure is now. The 1987 statute Mrs. Jurgen violated was designed to enforce provisions of South Carolina school improvement laws. And we look at this more closely. This is the pen tree big annotation for it. And there are these empty categories. There are several pieces of this tree that where there's no word. So there are nodes that don't dominate any words. Um, so for example, here, this is an omitted that 
you'll notice that I could have inserted the word that here. So the 1987 statute that Mrs. Jurgen violated, that would be perfectly fine. Um, but it, that didn't exist and they happen to have decided to annotate that optional that there. Um, also, you'll remember the empty categories that occurred in these unbounded dependencies. So Mrs. Jurgen violated is an, is an object extracted relative clause. So the object of violate is extracted and it appears up here. And that is represented, that extraction is represented by this T, which is for trace, which goes to syntactic theory of the time to explain. All you need to know is that T is for an empty category of an extraction. Um, so that's an empty category. There are other uh, empty categories here that um, that give you what are called not what you think of as non-canonical argument realization positions. So this is where an ordinary argument uh, it doesn't manifest in where you might expect it to. In particular, um, uh, just to explain what each of these is. So the, um, the each of these three empty categories has an index number, this one, two, and three, which actually indicate the relationship of that empty category to something else in the sentence. So this extracted object position relates to this WH word because it's this WH word's role in the clause is of being the object to violate it. That's the first example. The second example would be this. Um, this empty category indicates the design is being used in the passive voice. And so what in the active voice would be the object of design is manifested in the subject of this clause. So the 1987 statute plays in the passive voice as the subject, what it would be doing in the object position in the active voice. And finally, this last one is what's called a control relationship. So the what is it, um, who's going to be do who or what is going to be doing the enforcing, it's going to be this thing right here. Well, this thing right here is actually the subject of the whole sentence. So it's the 1987 statute is going to would be doing the enforcing under the design. And so you can see that actually some of the rich syntactic properties that underlie the sentence actually give you clues once again to the meaning of the sentence. So this structure in quite a sophisticated way actually gives you guides for how the meanings of the part phrases are composed into larger units. So this is so one set of pen tree band conventions around empty categories. Another one is about sort of how much bracketing and what, what non-terminal labels and what, what, non, uh, what phrasal labels are used. So annotations are often quote unquote flatter than what one often might find theoretically ideal. So this is in the top, this is the actual pen tree bank annotation. For Japan, the controversial trend improves access to American markets and technologies. We've already seen that actually we might want to say, well, really, at this position, controversial, I could have a whole adjective phrase, like the very controversial or the only slightly controversial. So really there's a whole phrase there, not just a word. And so I might want to add a phrase there. The Pentry Bank doesn't consistently bother to do this. Likewise with coordinations, this structure here, it doesn't tell you whether it's just markets that is American or technology is American. If I wanted to be a little more consistent about that, I'll also you'll notice that once again, in each of these noun positions, um, I could have an entire noun phrase there. And so if I wanted to be a little bit more consistent and thorough, so theoretically, I might add this bit of noun phrase, um, this noun phrase annotation, also add an adjective phrase here. That's often just left out of the pen tree bank. Nevertheless, there's a lot of information in here that's extremely useful. The phrasal category inventory is uh, fairly straightforward. You have things that you've already seen before, like adjective phrases, adverb phrases, noun phrases, prepositional phrases, sentences, verb phrases. There's a couple of other things to say. So S bar is both complement clauses and relative clauses. Um, uh, there are uh, various top level annotations for inversions and questions and so forth. And there's a rich inventory of different kinds of WH questions, like questions like why, who, where, from what, and so forth. The tag set is richer. It's very closely related to the old brown corpus tag set. Um, and it's a sort of a medium fine grained tag set. So for example, singular and plural nouns are distinguished. Proper and or nouns, singular and plural, are distinguished from improper, from or common nouns. Uh, verb form is uh, distinguished in all of the possible inflections and so forth. But there are finer grained distinctions that are not always made. So I would call this a medium fine grained tag set representation. Um, a few more tidbits about the pen tree bank. Spaces always delimit word boundaries. So um, an example of this, ice cream to a linguist 
is probably just a single word. You can hear that from the um, from the intonation. There's only one stress, and it's on ice. So it's not ice cream, it's ice cream. It's probably a single word, but it's represented as two words orthographically, and the pen tree bank represents it as two words. Incidentally, this is from a spoken example, and these other little bits right here are actually interjection and disfluency markers. So these are spoken annotations that are really only used for, um, for speech. So there's some special speech-specific syntax to talk about. Um, also, all tree leaves, both word and entity categories, are dominated by their part of speech alone. Um, and so you can see that the last rewrite getting to any leaf is a unary rewrite. It, if I were to write it as a context-free rule, it would have only one daughter on the right-hand side. Um, and very generally speaking, you can treat tree bank annotations mostly as derivation trees from a context-free grammar, but a lot of the time, it's useful to think of the annotations as not saying here's the grammar exactly that you want, but these are the sort of, this is information about the syntactic structure that the grammar that you want should be pretty consistent with. And so for example, I might have more or less phrasal annotation because maybe I'm not totally satisfied with the pen tree bank's phrasal annotations and so forth. But by and large, the kinds of information that the syntax specifies, like what words aren't grouped together, is going to be information that's useful and important to get and to respect and tells us about the statistics of English. And now how do you find out what are the structures in the language? So one very useful tool that I was actually uh, um, uh, a, a co-developer of is a, a search tool for finding tree, for specifying tree patterns that match with parts of trees and then pull out the results. So this is T regex or tregex. Um, and it allows you to specify both sort of these hierarchical relations like this. So for example, this is a, a sentence that dominates a noun phrase and the noun phrase dominates a prepositional phrase and so forth. And ultimately um, they will match trees and there will be fragments of trees. These are the fragments that are required to be matched for this particular pattern. And they also allow you things like regular expression to specify what the node is. So if I want to sp specify any of a collection of words, I can label a, a label part of the expression as with a regular expression. And um, there will be more information about how to use tregex, tregex, and you can download it um, if you search for it. It's very easy to find, and we'll be using it um, for the P set. So we'll stop for now and continue with more information about um, context-free grammars, what kinds of structures are common and rare, and what we might want to do in order to actually account for human language abilities with them.